so. We've made it to episode three of the flight school for flight simulators. And you probably noticed at the end, I came in really catawampus, as my instructor would say. Everything about that approach was a mess. And so, but odds are, if you and I were just flying those together for the first time, you probably did a lot worse. And, um, you know, in your first lesson that you usually take with an instructor, it's an introductory flight. So you can consider that one that. Um, in a normal one, the instructor would be there to kind of correct the mistakes you're making and coach you through it. That's the best I can do on a computer. Um, and landing is really the hard part of flying. Every other part, more or less, is pretty obvious. If you've driven a car up until landing, you can probably fly. It takes only a few minutes to teach you how to coordinate things. Um, and in the introductory flight, you don't do anything too difficult. You just spend an hour up there getting a feel for whether you get motion sickness, whether you feel comfortable taking the controls at all. Um, you know, the basics of what all the parts of the plane do. A lot of people haven't taken any ground school before they do it. Um, so uh, I'm going to go over a bit of the aerodynamics of a plane so you can understand what the hell you just did and why. Um, I'm going to start with the basics. I've got a Cessna 172 model here. And you've got four forces of flight, no matter what kind of plane it is. You've got lift, which is generated by the wings that takes you up. You've got gravity pulling you down. Um, and you've got thrust generated by the propeller pulling you forward. And then there's drag, which can be caused by like headwinds. They can be caused by parts of the plane such as bugs on here, um, your landing gear, every part of this plane that isn't generating lift is generating drag. And even the parts that are generating lift are sometimes generating drag. Um, so, you know, in short, your thrust pulls you forward. The drag would push you back. Um, and gravity does what gravity always does. But lift is created by your relationship of air across the airfoil. And the things that you have to learn, especially if you did one of these and went straight into the ground when you tried landing, is your speed and the angle of attack because let's say you slowed down just fine you went too slow and you went beneath um, the speed that these can generate lift at every plane's got a stall speed but um, if you turned too steeply and then fell or you kept pulling back because you saw you were falling and you broke say about that then you hit the stall point especially if you heard a horn going which usually you will hear as you're coming in for the final landing on your landing strip You'll see right about here, you'll hit that point in the flare, and your main gear will touch down. And you'll hear the stall horn. If you heard it before, you pulled back too far. Um, these wings only work when air is moving across them. And when it gets to a certain point, the airflow no longer smoothly moves across the surface of the wing and generates lift. Um, it starts generating not lift. 
and the first thing that happens is one of your wings dips. And then if you don't immediately gain speed and wind by pushing forward, you will not have any more lift and you will just kind of do that. If instead you're coming in like this, you hear the stall horn, you put your nose down, gain some speed, get that angle of attack right, um, then you can pull back out of it. Um, but if you get into the point where you have an aerodynamic stall, which you can do at any altitude, any speed, if you go like this at 200 miles an hour, you're not going to fly. Uh, it doesn't really matter. At some point, you stop pulling air across those wings, you will stop flying. And, you know, it doesn't have much to do with the horizon when we say tilted. The air is also generated by you moving forward. So, um, you know, if you pull too high up, most of the wind is coming like this, and it will not generate the wing, the lift across the top of the wing you need. So, you might ask, how can a fighter jet do it? Eh, it's got a thrust to weight ratio that's very different. Um, in its case, it's still moving air across the wings doing this. But it has so much thrust that it's generating lift anyway. Um, in this sense, when it gets to this point, it's really more of a freaking shuttle rocket than it is an airplane. Once it gets to about here, it can generate lift again. But it's also true that if you go fast enough this way, you will have wind going across it like that. And so there is an aerodynamic effect across these wings still. Otherwise, you'd have no control with your uh, elevators or rudder because those only work because of wind too. Now a jet can use things, like a fighter jet can use things like thrust vectoring and change the direction of its nozzle to do that. But um, for a normal plane, you're relying on your rudder, which is back here, controlling the yaw. You're relying on your elevator, which is these tiny set of wings right here, doing more lift or less lift. And um, you're relying on lift from your wings. And also, you've got these things right here on the outer. There's two sets of, uh, let's say, flappy things on the back of the wing. These right here are your ailerons, and these are your flaps. So the ailerons control roll. If you just held your ailerons like that, provided your plane was made for it, and uh, provided you could continue getting fuel to the engine because there's gravity feed involved and this don't work in some planes, you really have to have a plane that's meant to fly inverted if you're gonna you know, fly again. Anyway, any plane can fly inverted once. Um, special planes can keep doing it over and over. Um, then this would control that. So as you're coming in, you've got to use your rudder to control where you're going to end up on the runway. If you're like me, you end up doing that. Um, but you also notice you probably were getting a little bit of this, especially if you forgot to turn your wind off. And your aileron controls that. Your elevator make sure that you land on your main gear and then settle down with the front because if you land like this in a real plane you'll damage the uh, front gear you may damage the prop you'll also have all kinds of insanity you never want to do that even in big planes especially they touch down with the main gear now some of you might ask what about a tail 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 dragging plane Instead of having this, they're here. They touch down with the mains. 
and then eventually that rear wheel comes down. But it's really just a caster in a lot of these um, planes. You really spend most of your time doing this on your mains, then you come down to the caster when you no longer have enough lift to stay up. In our case, we do the same thing, but we come with the forward. Um, close here. So anyway, you're asking yourself, okay, that's all well and good, but how do I use that? Well, the thing is, when you're coming in for landing, you're doing a few different things. Not only are you trying to hit a spot, you're also handling um, going into what we call a slow flight. And with slow flight, all the controls get way sloppier. They don't work as well because everything in this is, like I said, this is all based on lift or deflection of wind. And so when it gets slower, your elevator doesn't generate as much lift. Your rudder doesn't work as well, but it still works better than these ailerons. So um, you may find as you come in for a landing, your rudder does a lot more for getting you at the runway surface than you thought. You know, when you're flying, a lot of times it's your ailerons doing most of the turning and you just kind of kick the rudder in so that it banks correctly. Because if you fail to use your rudder, if you're only using your ailerons, you'll turn like this and it'll kind of turn, but it's not turning well. You need to kick the sailor rudder in so that the rear of the plane turns with it and it becomes a nice coordinated turn. Now in slow flight, you just don't have as much power in these ailerons anymore. But the rudder still works really well. So if you're coming in, the plane will do more of this. If you try to do this, not only is that not terribly effective low to the ground, but you're really putting yourself at risk of touching down with your wing first, which is a good way to kind of turn into a really neat cartwheel display made of human beings. So don't do that. Um, so again, you'll come in, You'll set it down on the rear wheels. And all of these things, these are your, these are your flaps. You say, what do flaps do? Why do I need them? I, I flew all the way there, I took off without them. What they do is they generate a little more lift and they help you slow the plane down a bit. Um, You'll notice when I said we have to get in the white arc before we put our first flaps down. And the reason is that these generate a considerable amount of drag. And if you're going too fast, that drag can damage the flaps or the wings they're attached to, and that's not something you want. So get it below into the white arc, then you can put your flaps in. And you'll notice the second you put in the flaps, your nose popped up. And you didn't see that happening on mine because one of the things about flight that you'll need to learn too is you need to build muscle memory that first landing you make it's going to be impossible um in a real plane your instructor would have taken over and kind of gave you some advice like just run the rudder i'll handle the ailerons and keep us straight or something or they'll just land it for you um depends on how well you are how brave you are and whether you just give up when it comes in and it starts, you start freaking out. And people do that too. Um, in X plane, that just means you're going to crash. But hey, you didn't die. So, uh, the important part here is to know that when you get to those slower speeds, you're going to need flaps to stay stable. And, um, it's also a good time to talk about a sixth sense you probably didn't know you have. You'll notice that despite me having experience in real planes, landing an X plane and setting up that uh, setting up that pattern 
is a lot harder than it is in real life. In real life, I can quickly glance back to check to see my relationship with the runway. I can just kind of tell from a vibe check whether I'm close enough to the runway or not. You kind of get a feel for it um, because you can kind of see around you. You can see your turning radius. You just know how the plane feels. When you're in a bank, you can feel it. There's this whole sense of what they call, uh, boy, I have a web page open so I can pronounce it right, proprioception. It's the sense of self-movement, force, and body position. When you're flying, it really gets easy to understand, oh, if I do this, I feel my stomach pulling down. I feel everything in my body shifted to one side. I feel like the whole plane kind of sliding like this in the wind. Those aren't senses you get in a uh, flight simulator. And unless it's one of the cool full motion ones they use when they're training for uh, like a 747. Those things they do give you a pretty reasonable representation of the forces on your body. Um, so if you don't feel those forces, you'll struggle because they're a key part of learning to fly a plane and building that muscle memory. When I turn this, I need to just kind of give it a certain amount of rudder. When you're flying that plane, it just becomes natural. You just automatically, when I do this, I'll just watch the ball every so often. But honestly, my feet know where to go when my hands do this. And then to land, you have to learn to decouple that and go, okay, this will keep me from coming in one wing down, one wing up, and my tail is going to keep me maintaining the correct glide slope and doing the left to right corrections I'll need to land on the center line. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but when you get it, you get it. It took me probably about 14 or 15 hours of flying in a real plane before I did an instructor didn't touch the control sort of landing. Um, he was always jumping in there and saying, hey, uh, let me get, and he would just add a little rudder if I wasn't doing it. I could feel the controls change. Or he would start to take the controls and I would kind of, all right, he's doing that. Or he would just make gentle corrections to what I'm doing if he saw, and I could feel those corrections and he would tell me he's doing it. But, you know, it's kind of a process. It's a coaching thing. And I would say it's honestly one of the hardest things about flying an X-Plane or Microsoft Flight Simulator is you lack the vast majority of what pe what pilots use to fly when you're doing it this way, other than their own eyes. And um, I suspect that's part of why people like flying these jets, because they get to use all the uh, ILS, they get to use the... Uh, BORs, localizers, and other stuff to kind of compensate for the limited viewport you have, which, as you notice, I can turn, but I can, it takes forever. I need to be able to just glance back, glance forward, and my hands, I know I haven't moved them. I can kind of feel if I do and correct for it, because even if I'm not looking where I'm going, I'm feeling the plane is starting to turn. Okay, I better just correct my controls. You could probably fly the plane like this without even looking when you get decent enough. I mean, you'll need some visual reference to the ground, and it's hard to explain how much that matters in real life. Um, you know, uh, my first um, simulated instrument time was done on a starless night or a moonless night. It was just the stars and me over open farmland. And the horizon just disappears. There's no moon. You see a few stars, but there's not. You can't tell the ground where the ground ends and the, the night starts. And it's more disorienting than I think you'll ever realize the first time it happens. 
because it's like driving in the dark with the goggles on or even just trying to walk through your house with goggles on. You know that you can do this stuff in the dark when you go take a leak in the middle of the night without turning the lights on. But you have some sort of reference. The problem is when you're flying, you can't rely on your inner ear the same way you can in real life. Um, You know, I feel my relationship to the plane, not my relationship to the ground. So if I'm in a tight bank, I feel downward force into my seat, which is at an angle. So if I'm thinking, oh, I need to straighten out, and I try to use my inner ear to do it, I'm going to get in a feedback loop where this is straight. Um, And that's why we use gyroscopes and things like that to help understand where the plane really is in relationship to the ground. Um, Because if you rely only on your senses other than your eyes, you are going to just spiral down and crash. Everything's going to feel wrong. We even get things like somatographic illusion, where an increase in thrust feels like a pitch up, even though it's not. It's just the fluid in your inner ear react going backward. And your immediate reaction is, it's because I'm doing that. So people pitch down to correct for it. And if they do that, if you have a visual reference, your eyes immediately know, that's not what that is. I'm accelerating. Without visual reference, it feels like you're falling backward. So your initial sense is just a push forward. Um, there's been commercial flights that have crashed because of uh, somatographic illusion. Um, It's incredibly important to have some sort of visual reference. So you'll notice one of the controls I didn't really talk about um, in that plane, or uh, one of the gauges, it's like a little airplane that... um, Uh, shows your planes, it's an artificial horizon, it shows your planes relationship to the ground. And uh, if you ever have to switch to um, visual, or or you lose your visual reference, you got to immediately learn to switch to that. It's really interesting. And it kind of digressing, because I'm not going to go over instrument flight rules. But um, that's part of why I said just turn the weather to normal, because if you fly through a cloud in a in flight simulator and you don't know how all that stuff works, you're gonna crash too. And we haven't really gotten over into things like um, crosswind and um, how the plane actually tracks over the ground when there's wind coming at it from one direction. Um, but those are really interesting topics and I'll get into those in a later video. Um, you know, calm air, all that. Give your landings a few more shots. Now that I've explained what all those controls do, experiment with them. If you're in a real plane, you don't have the luxury of doing that too much without an instructor. And uh, some of it, you learn more from like crashing it than you realize. So go ahead and crash it. You have my permission. I encourage you, crash the damn thing. Learn how it performs when you push down the controls. Learn how it performs when you pull back all the way. Learn how it performs if you bank it wrong. And for our next lesson, we're going to do slow flight in the simulator because that will make all the difference in your landings. With that, I'm going to wrap it up for the evening. Have a great night.